The Sweet Sound of Success show is brought to you by The Mentor Studio. The Mentor Studio is an exclusive mentoring and training program for social influencers, business owners, entrepreneurs, coaches, and startups, bringing personal development to the underserved around the world. And brought to you by Success Strategists, simple strategies that work to develop your business with flow and ease using proven strategies and the right tactics. This is the Sweet Sound of Success with Sue Wilhite, Profit Attraction Master. Steve Garvin nearly lost his life to depression before discovering he was the author and editor of his life. With this new insight, he set out on a hero's journey to discover a richer story. Today, he helps authors, speakers, coaches, and healers reclaim the riches in their story. Welcome, Steve Garvin. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. It's nice to be here. Well, you know, when we met, it was like, oh my God, you've got to be on my show because we both have the hero's journey as the structure for what it is that we do. And mm. um, I think this is going to be so much fun. I love it when people are immersed in Joseph Campbell's work. <laughs> and for, Likewise. <laughs> yeah. And so for those of you who are uh, watching or listening to the show and you don't know who Joseph Campbell is, nor anything about the hero's journey, uh, Joseph Campbell was... Uh, an ethnologist and a mythologist who studied stories from all over the world and sort of distilled them into a, a pattern. And for the purposes of this show, I'm only taking five elements out of those, uh, out of those multiple elements <laughs> that he put, put out. And uh, what we're going to talk about uh, in relation to the entrepreneur's journey is uh, Steve's ordinary beginning, which after 30 something episodes, I still laugh at because nobody has an ordinary beginning. Uh, <laughs> the call to action, what brought Steve into, uh, or as you heard in his bio, <laughs> down to his call, um, the big hairy monsters, which are going to be a large part, I'm sure, of our discussion. Allies, mentors, and guides. Now, this is something that I feel is sadly neglected in most entrepreneurial stories and how we, as a culture, view entrepreneurs. We see the, the guys in the garage or we see you know, the women overcoming odds. And what we don't see are the people who are behind them. So I like to highlight and bring forth guides, mentors, allies, wind beneath the wings, inspirations, that sort of thing. Um, and then the journey home, which Joseph Campbell uh, was particularly fascinated with because once the hero has emerged into this new way of being, and in our case, being an entrepreneur, that first dollar that you get, the first client that you get to work with, changes you completely. And how do other people in your life deal with your new way of being, literally? So, Steve, what was your ordinary beginning? <laughs> My ordinary beginning. I go, my mind is going back to two places. One, when I was just probably six years old and I'd already developed a love for story. In fact, to the degree that I created my first book about that time. And of course it wasn't, you know, it was a children's, it was a book created by a child. So it was lots of imagination and uh, 
not what you traditionally think of as, as a book, but it had lots of heart, lots of character in it. And it just really expressed that freedom that that's within a child. And then after that, I largely put away story other than for assignments in school and so forth. And, and just really didn't consider myself um, very artistic or creative. And one of the reasons that that is, is because my dad was very creative and everything that I did in comparison to him wasn't, well, <laughs> didn't compare. Well, <laughs> and so I just really suppressed my creative voice and found a safe place. So I thought eventually in corporate finance. Oh. And uh, I thought that was a pinnacle or I was approaching the pinnacle of my career. I had gotten my master's degree. I was no longer having to look for work. I was being sought after rather than being the seeker. And it was just in a lot of ways, a, an enviable place to be. It was also a very depressing place to be. Right. There's not a lot of room. And in fact, I bet creativity is not encouraged in the financial world. No, it's not. Cre creativity in the financial world leads to things like Enron and WorldCom, right. and that type of thing. Right. I think there is actually more room for creativity in, in accounting than we allow for, but... But as I've often told people in the past, you know, I'm going to, I am, or I have been a creative accountant and I've literally had people tell me you can't be there. That's impossible. Well, <laughs> maybe <Yeah. laughs> the two at, at that time definitely did not uh, have a good relationship. <laughs> right. right. So since then, I've gone on a journey, as you described somewhat in the, your introduction. Yeah, so what was your call to action? <laughs> well, my call to action was that after working in the last job that I had, where, again, I was thinking that I took the job largely because it was 50% more money than what I had been making before. Okay. That's a significant job. Right. And I'm like, okay, this is cool. And I'll do with it, do whatever I've got to do to, to make this work. Right. What I didn't realize was the cost of making that work. And it sent me down to a very dark place. And eventually I, the last, few months and and that job i constricted whooping cough and would cough so hard that i'd pass out and uh, the next when i returned to work after being out for a few weeks which was not a popular decision on my part i mean i'm, I'm coughing so hard i'm literally passing out but they still want me to be at work right right <laughs> and so i returned to work and my boss doesn't talk to me for five days. And what she does is to pull me into her office with HR director and read me a long list of all my weaknesses and all the things that I'd been doing wrong and all this stuff. And uh, it sent me into a, an even darker place. And the next morning I woke up determined to end the pain that I was feeling. And shortly before that happened, I was in the, the restroom and I hear this voice that, I mean, it was one of those things that, what, did I hear it or was it just a thought or whatever? But, but the message was, don't use a permanent solution to solve a temporary problem. Ooh, good one. <laughs> and oh, that was enough for me to pause. <laughs> that's a great tagline. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so that actually pausing, put it, pushing pause on that part of my story and, and realizing slowly, it wasn't like, okay, you now have it all figured out, go do it. It was enough to, for me to stop and to think about what am I trying to do? Who am I trying to be? 
and how do I create a life that is more fulfilling for myself than what I have been experiencing? Right. And that began a whole new chapter in my life. Wow. That's amazing. That, that, I love that. So don't, let me see if I've got it right. Don't use a permanent solution for a temporary uh, situation. Right. Wow. Wow. Huh. That, I love that. That's fabulous. <laughs> so, um, so your big hairy monsters sound like uh, that boss and that HR person um, who collectively seem to be um, not compassionate, shall we say. Well, it was actually kind of good cop, bad cop. So uh, my yeah. boss was the one that was not compassionate. The HR director was quite compassionate and, and showed up a few months later when I was called into her office and she was telling me that they were letting me go and I'm literally biting my tongue because I'm just so elated to be out of that place. <laughs> and she did it as kindly as she possibly could. And I'm, I'm feeling really kind of mixed feelings because I'm literally biting my tongue because I don't want to laugh while she's being so compassionate. Right. Right. <laughs> so exactly. I, I had changed a lot in that process and it was just an interesting turn of events. So the things that drove you into what you call those dark places, was it, was it their judgment of you? Or do you think it was something that was trying to come out inside of you that, that needed to come out and they were just they were just the catalysts that that happened. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> In a lot of ways, it was a a not it was a, a toxic environment for me. Mm. But there was also in a way, well, in a lot of ways, it was actually a really good thing that things happened the way that they did because I had been suppressing my creative expression for decades. I've been really not allowing the person that I am to come forth. And that can't, for me, came at an incredible cost. And I'm, as I've seen with other people that I've worked with and talked with, um, you know, whenever we suppress ourselves, Whenever we hold back who we really are, that just comes at a terrible cost. Certainly. Absolutely. Absolutely. So who were some of the allies, mentors, guides um, that you can um, be part of uh, who, who helped you along the way? So one of the things that comes to mind, first of all, is I've always been an avid reader. Books have always been the place that I go to for escape, for instruction, for guidance, for, you know, all kinds of things. And some of the key people that showed up, you'll like one of them, at least. Um, Joseph Campbell's work really started showing up for me. Another concept that would came forward was, uh, you know, just some psychological concepts like uh, Maslow's hierarchy and, right. but I, and I was, I'd been reading psychology books for a long time, but instead of reading it more for information, I was starting to read them for, okay, how do I actually start putting my life together? You know, how do I interpret this? How do I apply this in my own life rather than just, you know, if I add one more book to my bookshelf, I'll be better off. And I very much think that's still true, but, uh, but if the books just remain on the bookshelf and they don't, aren't opened and we don't find the wisdom in them for ourselves, we don't figure out how to apply what they're teaching us, then they don't do as much good. 
and so I started to look and see how can I start applying what I am learning from these other people. And a couple of things that, that came forward. First of all, I learned both from my studies, as well as my personal experience that, you know, even though self-actualization is at the top of that pyramid, it doesn't have to, you don't have to wait until everything underneath it is taken care of. You know, you can actually begin with that idea of self-actualization. How do I become the person that, that I want to be? So there was that aspect of self-actualization. Another concept that, that really came forward for me was the concept of self-determination, mm -hmm. which looks at, and various people talk about it in different ways. I personally talk about it as far as passion, purpose, and people, that when we have, you know, good balances in, in those accounts, so to speak, that, you know, our, our lives are much better. And then, I mean, I could go on and on, but another one that was really instrumental for me was Carl Jung, not Carl Jung's, although Carl Jung was definitely in influential Carl Rogers personality theory, which talks about the difference between the actual self and the ideal self. And the, the more that we can reconcile the gap between those two people, the, the more that we can heal and uh, go on that hero's journey. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's so much, um, there is so much out there that's available now more, so much more. I mean, just, just uh, the exponentially more. <laughs> I mean, I can't even attach numbers to it. We have more ways of, of strategies, of information, of data, of, of processes available to us now than we've ever had in the history of humankind. We just have so much available to us. Um, and, and I have to say, uh, Steve, I, I don't think you know this about me, but at one point in my hero's journey, um, I made a joke uh, that I didn't have enough books, so I had to buy a bookstore, <laughs> uh, which, is, which was a true story. And it was part of my journey for, for a few years. So. Um, I books and I have a grand relationship <laughs> and you're right. But if you don't get anything out of them, I mean, you know, that was one of the things that people would buy all of these books in my bookstore. And then I'd go, well, how did you like it? Well, it's still sitting there. You know, I haven't cracked. This <laughs> you know, it's a really great book. It's got some really good stuff in it. If you don't use it, then, you know, it's a, it's a doorstop. It's, you know, it's recycling, it's composting material. Right, makes a great paperweight, but it doesn't. Makes a great paperweight <laughs> in a self-recursive sort of way. Um, so yeah, um, but, but there is stuff out there and I would strongly encourage uh, my viewers and listeners to check out uh, Maslow and Rogers and Jung uh, and Joseph Campbell just to start with. And, and that's a great point that you made, Steve, that um, in Maslow's hierarchy, you know, the self-realization, the self-actualization part, those, those six steps before that make it easier to get to self-realization and self-actualization. I mean, if you don't have a roof over your head and you're not getting food, Enlightenment is a lot harder, yeah. but it's not impossible. If you start with the goal in mind, then yeah, you, you don't have to have everything perfect underneath. And perfectionism is one of the worst things that can get in your way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I inherited a very healthy dose of perfectionism. So <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. So, so talk about some of that what was what was the journey home like well one of the first things that i did after leaving corporate finance and by the way the way i talk about it was that i was given my pink slip of opportunity <laughs> <laughs> <Nice>. and 
I felt like doing cartwheels out the door. So right. I was at least temporarily in a much better place. It didn't take long for the clouds to, to descend again. Mm. But one of the things that I did in that space was start to explore who am I as, as a person. Uh, one of the things that I did even before, it was actually while I was still dealing with it, out, while I was out on leave for whooping cough, I took all my roles and put them out on a spiral. So, you know, husband, father, oh. uh, accountant, artist, et cetera. And at the very end of that spiral was the word healer, which I'd never even considered before. I did not think of myself as a healer and I didn't really know what that meant, but that was part of my journey of figuring out what does that actually mean? And what does that particularly, what does that mean with regards to me? Um, and one of the first things that I did after leaving corporate as well was I stumbled upon the work of Whitney Freya, who has a book called the, I think it's the artist within I get, uh -huh. and she just talks about how, you know, we all have creative expression. We all have access to creativity. It, it, you're not just born with it. it it's something that, that we all have access to in different ways. And I enjoyed the book so much. And again, here's how books continue to show up in my life over and over again. Um, but I became certified as a, as a, creatively fit coach Bye. through her didn't really do anything with that other than it opened my expression a lot more than it had been uh, and i started doing if you could see my room you'd see three masks that i have hanging on the wall over there that i made and shortly afterwards i made some paper mache uh, mass. I also just really dabbled in lots of different creative expression. I, I've always been writing. So I continued that, but I also did, started doing photography. I started doing illustration. I started doing paper mache and jewelry making and all kinds of things just to kind of find what my creative voice was. And just really being open to how things looked. And one of the things that, that happened in that is that when I was doing my undergrad, one of the majors that I dabbled in and honestly nearly completed was a degree in art history. Ooh. And so I had studied the Renaissance masters, Titian and Caravaggio and Rembrandt and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so when I looked at my work and compared it to what I knew as being an artist's work, I again saw such a huge gap between myself and what they were doing that I was like, okay, I'm obviously not an artist because I don't, I can't do what they're doing. And then I, I was in the library, which is one of my favorite places to go. And I was in the children's book section. And I just started looking at some of the children's books and just realizing that you know, there's a whole lot more to creative expression, to art, to illustration than just the, the Renaissance masters, that I don't have to have the draftsmanship of Rembrandt in order to create something that is beautiful and remarkable and, and, and expresses who I am. Exactly. So I began to open up to that possibility. So playing with that and then just, you know, as I started to doing exercises that helped me to rebuild my sense of self and my self-worth, that things continued to improve. And we're talking years there. So it wasn't like, you know, I, I didn't go to some week long camp and my life was just, okay, now I'm singing and angels follow me everywhere I go and all that. Um, it was a lot of work and really difficult at times, but it also 
slowly over time just kept getting better and better. That is, as long as I continue to work on it and continue to figure out, you know, what my hero's journey is, you know, the hero's journey isn't this rosy walk through the park where, you know, you, you say, okay, well, I want this. And then, you know, 10 pages later, you've got this, you, you've got to face the monsters in the park. You've got right. to right. deal with the dark forest of the soul. You, you've got to you know, be willing to face those difficult times in order to get to the reward on the other side. Yeah. And so a lot of what I was doing, and one of the first things that I did was I started looking at, well, how do I get rid of those monsters in my life? How do I get rid of the, the darkness in my life? And I did a lot of purging, which was good, but there came to be a point when I'm like, okay, I've removed all this stuff from my life but I'm left, I'm still not happy. I'm still not fulfilled. What's missing. And I realized, well, there's two sides of that equation that, you know, you can get rid of all that negative stuff, but if you just get rid of the negative stuff and without replacing it with anything, you're just, you're still empty. Yeah. And so I started looking for, well, what are the positive things that I need to be engaging in, in order to, to turn things around? How do I rebuild my life and myself in a way that, leaves me with more rather than just without pain, which honestly, I don't know if we ever get to that point where there's no pain, but. But we can deal with it better. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't become something that shuts us down completely. It's just there. Right. Yes. Yeah. And honestly, that was one of the things that I learned along the way was, you know, if I just, ex and it didn't come this way, but the takeaway was, that if I just accept it, just accept where I am right now on the journey and don't fight it, then the journey is a whole lot easier, right? Exactly. So I, I found myself lying in bed, feeling depressed again, and I was starting to beat myself up again about, you know, you're letting yourself get down and, you know, you're, you're doing all this work and it's not working, et cetera, et cetera. And I just had this epiphany that that you know, instead of being my biggest critic, I could be my biggest cheerleader. That instead of beating myself up because I'd let myself get depressed again, I could be compassionate and you know, and encouraging and learn how. And it wasn't that this happened right then, but it eventually led to you know, I can be literally a cheerleader in my life, I can be the person who recognizes the good that I'm doing, the efforts that I'm making, the, the, you know, even if things don't turn out the way that I expected, that I gave my best effort and that I learned an awful lot in the process. Exactly. And that's, that's, I hope what my viewers and listeners are going to take away from this is life is not about beating yourself up. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what we're here for. Um, you know, there's, there's the whole other side of the narcissist, but mostly it's about, as you said, being compassionate with yourself and allowing yourself to move forward rather than, you know, cracking the whip and, and hurting yourself. Right. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah. When we're so focused on, that carrot that's ahead of us and we don't take care of ourselves. So we're using the whip instead of the whip in order to get the carrot. Right. 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 And then the carrot becomes meaningless because, you know, the whip is always there. Right. So if we can just turn things around and, you know, get rid of the whip, the, the, uh, negative reinforcement and instead to figure out ways to to provide a more positive reinforcement you know motivation that that we can have positive motivation that that moves us forward and we don't need to rely on negative motivation to move us forward exactly exactly so steve i have a bonus question for you <laughs> okay <laughs> of the things that you do right now for uh, your, your clients, your customers, the people that you work with, what's your favorite thing of all? <laughs> well, 
Well, my favorite thing is when my audience, my clients, the people that I work with, when the light goes on above their heads and they realize just as I did, I used to, until about six, eight months ago, I used to think of my story as being a tragedy. You know, it was a a tragic, when I talk about suicide and depression and and all that, you know, it it kind of lent itself to to being this tragic story. And I was involved in a international speaking contest with Toastmasters and it was a humorous speech contest. And I was talking about my struggles and figuring out some way to, to tell the story in a humorous way. And I realized, you know, there is a lot of humor here. You know, the, it's kind of at times dark humor, right. but, but there's still some ironic things, some funny things that, that happen. And, and ultimately, I think it was, I don't know if it was, I always f- confuse the, the Greek philosophers, but either Aristotle or Plato or so, yeah, what was one the- of them yes. said that there are two types of stories. There are comedies and there are tragedies, right? That would be Aristotle, yes. Aristotle, thank you. <laughs> anyway, and the way that I interpreted that was that there are those stories that have at the end of the story, it, the, the character's worse off than they were at the beginning. And, or at the end of the story, the, the character's better off than they were at the beginning. And we can always, even if things don't go our way, we can always be better off because we could have, we can learn so much from things not going our way. You know, with, I became really, really good at the work that I did back when I was in accounting because I learned from all my mistakes. You know, when I, when I did a shortcut code and, and it didn't work out the way that I expected it to, instead of just saying, okay, that was a failure. I asked myself, well, what can I learn from that? And consequently, I became really good at programming Excel and other things because I was willing to learn from my mistakes. And if we can remember to learn from our mistakes and to see the heroism in facing those difficult times, you know, I think our stories can always end up being these triumphant stories. Right. I always tell people, you know, if you you cannot remember learning to walk, Mm. but you fell down an awful lot (laughs) during that (laughs) period and not once did you go, well, I think I'm never going to learn to walk. Not going to (laughs) happen. I'm awful at walking. My legs just won't hold me. I'm never going to be like everybody else. No. That's not what happened. Absolutely. Everybody got up and walked. <laughs> like, I'm going to do this, no question. And yeah, if we could just invoke that, that portion of our inner child that's determined to move forward no matter what, then yeah, it's a yeah. great thing. That's interesting that you bring that up. One, because that's one of the things that I think about a lot is that, you know, we learned how to walk. We learned how to talk. We learned how to, you know, tire shoes and ride bikes and drive cars. And, you know, it didn't just, there wasn't a, a light switch that was flipped and we went from crawling across the floor to walking and running across the floor. And, and if we can allow ourselves to have that same sense of freedom, sense of play, then we can still do amazing things today, even though we're, 40, 50, 60 years further along. 80, 90. <laughs> right. Yes. yes. I just heard about somebody who celebrated their 90th birthday and had a product launch, a very <laughs> successful product launch. Wow. Your product launch at 90. That's, that's great. Without ever having touched Facebook before in her life. <laughs> so, you know, it's a process. And if we recognize that it's a process, and we allow it to be a process and that we're going to move forward and that it's going to happen, then we're good. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you for being my guest. This has been um, an interesting hero's journey. Um, this is, I, won't, I won't say that all parts of it have been fun. Obviously, they weren't, but... Um, this is definitely one of the inspiring shows. 
um, I, I absolutely applaud your determination and your acceptance of that message that came to you mm. that, that you chose to listen to and move forward. And now you make a difference in other people's lives. So thank you for that. And thank you to the listeners and viewers of The Sweet Sound of Success. your dreams for your business. You know what drives me crazy? Really smart business owners denying their talents because they've been taught it has to be hard, because they've been taught that they don't deserve their gifts, that they're not worth anything. They've been taught that their gender means they can't express their genius. I'm Sue Wilhite, and I want you to have access to your genius. I want you to go out and rock the world with your genius. So I created the Call to Action Coaching Program. It's all about getting to the heart of you and what you've got to share with the world to make a profitable business that thrives and allows you to make a difference in the world. Click the link to sign up for the Call to Action Coaching Program today. Don't let your genius go unnoticed.